So I recently decided to reread the Alabasta arc, and I was actually pretty surprised how much content is in that arc that connects to current events. You know, stuff like Sanji wanting to force his way into sharing a bed with Vivi for the night. Actually, no, that's not what I meant. Although that actually did happen. But I mainly mean stuff like Vivi saying that the Sandora River was gradually being overcome by the sea, which means that the sea levels were rising even back then. There's also the fact that much like Wano, the capital city of Alubarna appears to have been built on a platform to withstand the rise of a potential catastrophic tide. Plus the fact that sea cats are considered to be sacred in Alabasta. There's even a cat statue that King Cobra has to push in order to be able to walk down into the Tomb of Kings, which is where the Poneglyph is. And we see some cats adorning the main hall of the tomb as well. Oh, and by the way, sea cats are heavily featured in Jinbei's cover story, where not only does he find the underwater ruins of an ancient town, but he also ends up finding a poneglyph. So yeah, it's pretty obvious that these cats have some connection to the Void Century. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, so for now just keep the image of this tomb in the back of your mind. Now in order for this video to be what I want it to be, I have to talk about Crocodile. And in order to hype Croc up accordingly, I have to mention this video right here, which was made by Doc Sake. And one of the main premises of the video stems from a statement that Oda made a while back about how originally One Piece was only supposed to last five years. At first, One Piece was just supposed to be a much shorter story about Luffy fighting and defeating the Yonko. And the reason why the manga transformed into the Odyssey that we know now is twofold. Number one, One Piece became a moneymaker for Shueisha and Shonen Jump. And now it's not just them. If you look at how much the series has grown in popularity, there's a ton of other departments, a ton of other branches that depend on the story to generate income. We have light novels and vivery cards. We have the anime. We have a second anime. We have a successful Netflix live action adaptation. We have trading cards. We have video games. YouTubers whose livelihoods are tied to discussing the series. Toys and collectibles. Movies that are released in theaters every so often and boost the franchise's name via ticket sales. I want to show you this real quick because I think it's pretty relevant to the point that I'm making. The Taylor Swift subreddit has 2.7 million followers. Okay, so those are the Swifties. The One Piece subreddit just reached 4 million followers. It's insane to me how much One Piece has grown in popularity over the last couple of years. Six years, seven years ago, this would have been unheard of. And a couple months back, I was listening to a One Piece podcast episode that had a conversation between Stephen Paul and Greg. Now, I've mentioned Greg here plenty. He lives in Japan. He knows Oda. He has an official One Piece column. And then Stephen Paul is the official English translator for the One Piece manga. Now, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically a point that got brought up in their discussion is that even when One Piece ends, it won't end. It's just too big, and there are too many parts that hinge upon its longevity, as I just talked about, like the different departments, different branches, different, different jobs that depend on One Piece's longevity. And I've seen it happen with several series that I've been a fan of that just get extended after their quote unquote end. I've seen it happen with Naruto. I've seen it happen with Avatar The Last Airbender. I've seen it happen with Star Wars. I've seen it happen with Dragon Ball. I've seen it happen with Harry Potter. And that's just like a few examples that I can think of at the top of my head. Now successful series getting spinoffs or getting extra content to them isn't inherently wrong. It's just capitalism in action. And so with that understanding, something that that has helped me digest is that I do not foresee a scenario where we get to that final chapter of One Piece and the fandom is left with absolutely no more questions. Other successful series that are significantly shorter than One Piece have tried to give their fandoms the answers. And for the most part, like at the end, the author has to come out to give interviews, to clarify things, to answer fan questions. And if, and if that doesn't happen, there's like, you know, supplemental materials or like, you know, you have to go watch a show or a movie to get like really like all the meat that you really wanted to get. I've seen it happen with Naruto. I've seen it happen with Avatar The Last Airbender. I've seen it happen with Star Wars. I've seen it happen with Dragon Ball. I've seen it happen with Harry Potter. And that's just like a few examples that I can think of at the top of my head. It's just capitalism in action. Anyway, the point here is, is that even though during the early stages of the story, One Piece's international popularity was not quite at the level that it is today, it was still incredibly popular in Japan. And this gave Oda, Shonen Jump, and Shueisha an incentive to extend the series beyond its original five-year lifespan.
This is also something that I imagine came very easily to Oda, because he just enjoys creating and introducing new characters. Case in point, One Piece was originally just supposed to be about Luffy fighting the Yonko, but then Oda came up with the idea of the Shichibukai, so he introduced them, and that ended up stretching out the series. Something very similar to that happened in Wano, where I think the plan was to just have four scabbards, but then Oda just couldn't help himself, so he kept creating samurai, and he ended up with nine scabbards instead of the original four. And we could also say that something similar to that happened in Sabote, where Oda ended up creating the 11 supernova spontaneously without actually having a plan for them beforehand. Now, the reason why this matters is because once you wrap your head around the fact that One Piece was not supposed to be as long as it became, it gives you a different perspective on how valuable the early arcs in the story are in terms of finding clues that will connect directly to the end of the story. Again, stuff like Vivi mentioning the rising of the sea, or like Crocodile using his powers during his first appearance to dry up a lily flower. Okay, so now that it's been said that the five-year version of One Piece was supposed to be about Luffy fighting the four emperors, Dax Arcade's video actually does some work in terms of discerning who the four original emperors were supposed to be. Now, overall, I pretty much agree with all four of his proposals, but there are some points where my reasoning is a little bit different than his. And there's really no way of proving or disproving this anyway, unless you actually sit down and talk to Oda and ask him yourself. So I'm just going to give you my explanations and my takes. The first thing he says that I completely agree with is that Shanks was always going to be a Yonko. I think that's absolutely true. Shanks being in the first chapter of the story, appearing as sort of like this mentor for Luffy, like he was always supposed to be somebody that Luffy was going to try to surpass at some point. Now, the second character that Dax mentions as part of the original Yonko lineup is Whitebeard. Now, I would say that I agree with this, except I think that both Whitebeard and Blackbeard back then were supposed to be one character. And there's a couple reasons for this. One being that even though Whitebeard and Blackbeard sort of get introduced into the story around the same time, Blackbeard, I think, is actually the one that gets name dropped first. Also, Blackbeard is one of the most famous real life pirates. And we know that Oda did a lot of research before starting to write One Piece on pirates, like real life piracy. So if you look at the name of the real Blackbeard, right, his name is actually Edward Teach. And so I think what happened was is that Oda split those names up and he gave one name to each character because we know that Whitebeard's name is Edward Newgate and then Blackbeard's name is Marshall D. Teach. Plus, we also have the whole thing about Shanks having his three scars over his eye from the very beginning. And then we also know that Blackbeard ends up gaining Whitebeard's power and replacing him in the Yonko lineup. So I do think that Whitebeard and Blackbeard originally were supposed to be just one character. The third character that was always meant to be a Yonko is Kaido. We know that in addition to the Nika dance panel, this panel of Wano is one of Oda's favorites. And to me, there's really no way that a Japanese manga author would decide to tell a story about a kid pirate that's going around all over the world, visiting different places, and not have one of those islands be based off of Japan. This also becomes pretty obvious given how early Zoro was conceptualized into the story, because he has like the whole samurai code going on for him. So to me, it's like pretty obvious that there was going to be an arc about the land of samurai that involved Kaido from the very beginning. And then the fourth character that would have been a Yonko, had we gotten the five-year story, would have been Crocodile. And the reason why this works is that if you think about the Baroque work saga, you'll find that it's very similar in structure to the Wano saga. Because we start off by running into a royal family member who is undercover that has left their home country due to there being a crisis. Vivi is pretending to be a Baroque works agent while Kinemon and Momonosuke are pretending to be father and son. And so we kind of end up following these royal family members back to their home country to defeat the evil ruler there and bring peace to their respective kingdoms. So Crocodile's quote unquote Yonko saga is very similar to Kaido's Yonko Saga in that regard. And there's also a very big connection that I found recently with Momonosuke and Vivi, but I'll get into that a little bit later. We also know that Crocodile picked a fight against Whitebeard in the past, and so I think Oda showing two Yonko clashing to some degree would have also probably been part of the five-year story. This goes without saying, but it's pretty obvious that Big Mom would not have been part of the original plan, because for one, her full body design is the one that gets revealed last out of all the Yonko in the story. But then also, Oda decided to have two Supernova be the ones to defeat her in Wano. And we already know that Oda came up with the characters of the Supernova the week of their debut in the manga. So it's pretty obvious that the idea for Big Mom came after the five-year plan was extended. 
We can even take this one step further and plug in the crocodile used to be a woman theory here and say that crocodile was originally supposed to be the female Yonko instead of Big Mom. Now, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but there's just a lot of hints that point to crocodile being a baddie in her earlier years. So even Kaf, who's known for being able to change people's gender, says that he knows that crocodile has a secret. During Roger's execution, crocodile is the only character that we see from the back, possibly to hide her female features. Buggy, at one point, who was there at the execution, calls crocodile Kroko-chan, which is a Japanese Japanese honorific that is used for girls. Crocodile also tells Mihawk that they are similar because they don't trust anybody. In Egghead, Zoro makes a comment that implies that Mihawk might not be human, signaling that there might be a secret about Mihawk's identity that is yet to be revealed, just like with Crocodile. Chapter 938 is called A Woman's Secret, which features Crocodile in the cover. The picture that Oda drew of Crocodile as a kid looks pretty androgynous. Plus, he also drew Crocodile as a woman, and the way her hair is slicked back matches the design that we see during Roger's execution perfectly. And then and we also have the fact that in nature, the male to female ratio when it comes to crocodiles heavily favors females. I mean, it's literally 10 to 1. We also got the reveal during a cover story that Crocodile's dream was to become the Pirate King, so I wonder if she felt she needed to change to fit the title. And last but not least, something that I recently found by watching the anime is that according to the subtitles, when even Kof makes the deal of keeping Crocodile's past a secret, the sentence in Japanese uses the word ageru. And so listen to how even Kof says the word in the anime. Uh and so in English, the last word of the sentence is you, but in Japanese, the last word is ageru. So it makes it seem as if Ivankov is simultaneously saying you, but also a girl to crocodile. Okay, so now that we've said all that, imagine that you're Oda, okay? And you have a plan for a story that is going to take you five years. And in these five years, these four are your antagonistic forces. So what kind of story would you write with these four pillars standing in the way of your main character? Because to me, it's pretty obvious that the original plan was for each of these Yonko to be the strongest in their respective field. I think that from the very beginning, Shanks was going to be the strongest hockey user, Whitebeard was going to be the strongest Paramecia, Kaido was going to be the strongest Zoan, and Crocodile was going to be the strongest Logia user in the story. And the reason why I suspect that Yonko Crocodile was supposed to be the top one of Logias in the story is because if you look at the stuff that actually made it into the story, Crocodile talks like he's like a Logia pro. Like at one point, I believe there was even one translation that had him saying that he had honed his double fruit powers to perfection. I mean, what the f I'm pretty sure that line was actually responsible for making a lot of fans think that Crocodile was an awakened Logia user, which obviously hasn't been confirmed, but I do think it's super interesting that the first person in the entire story to mention the existence of Devil Fruit Awakenings is Crocodile in Impel Down. So yeah, I do believe that originally Crocodile was supposed to be this awakened Logia Yonko of sorts. And I guess now, the way the story is now, that role, that awakened Logia antagonistic role, would probably end up falling upon Akainu. Furthermore, this idea of the original five-year plan being about Luffy having to fight the strongest four characters in each category, strongest Haki, strongest Paramecia, strongest Zoan, and strongest Logia. The reason why I, I truly believe that is the case is because of what Kaido says to Luffy in Wano. And I know I've said this plenty of times, but I have to repeat it. It's a key piece of dialogue, in my opinion, in terms of what Oda is planning on doing. When Kaido says to Luffy, it's weird because your double fruit power has features of a Zoan, and a paramecia. The moment he said that, I was like, okay, you know, Luffy's already working on his hockey. His hockey is top tier. You know, his paramecia powers are really strong and his Owen powers are really strong. So to me, it was like obvious, okay, Luffy is getting a Logia power up at some point in this story. And again, it's pretty obvious that his element is going to be fire, just like his brothers. Now, a lot of the fan speculation about what a Logia awakening will actually do or look like in the story, I think comes from at least three sources. Number one, it comes from what Crocodile was doing in Alabasta, where he was creating a drought. It also comes from the aftermath of Aokiji versus Akainu in Punk Hazard. And I think it also comes from that Raijin Island, where we see like a bunch of lightning hitting the island over and over again near the beginning of the New World. Now, in rereading Alabasta, a key piece of information, a key piece of dialogue that I found is this panel from Cobra, where he says that the weather is controlled by the gods and that not even a king has power over it. So, weather is controlled by the gods. What does that mean? This is where my mind goes, okay? 
obviously it goes to the Skypea thing, the four different gods. What is it? God of the sun, God of the rain, God of the forest, God of the earth. That, that, that does come to mind. But at the same time, it also goes back to Whitebeard's speech or like Whitebeard's talk with Marco, where he says that atop of the red line before Marijoa, it used to be called the land of gods. It also makes me think of that panel where Nami says that the top of the red line is essentially a collection of islands with different weather, different seasons. So if the weather is controlled by the gods and the top of the red line was known as the land of gods, does that mean that the islands were created by awakened Logia users that were considered gods? I've speculated before that a Logia awakening has to be sort of like this divine top tier power up because even Vegapunk says that he can't replicate Logias. Furthermore, and this is kind of a question, you know, food for thought. Cobra says that the gods control the weather and that not even a king has power over it. Now, I already know what some of you are going to say that Kaido said that only hockey can transcend all, but given the fact that we have never seen a Logia awakening in the story, could that line from Cobra perhaps be implying that a Logia awakening is actually stronger than top tier conquerors hockey? Because I think that that's kind of what that's hinting at. Especially if you consider that Oda has kept what a Logia Awakening does a secret for this long. Now granted, you could still make the argument that if you are a hockey master, okay, if you've mastered all three types of hockey, if you maxed out your Conqueror's Armament and Observation Hockey, you can still make the argument that that character, whoever has those stats, could actually win against an Awakened Logia. So it could be that Cobra's quote is just referring to top tier Conqueror's Hockey, versus an awakened Logia. In addition, there are two key pieces of information that we get during the Alabasta arc that I don't see enough people talking about. But first, and speaking of gods, we know thanks to real world history that the Egyptians worshipped Ra, who was their god of the sun. And with Alabasta being based off of ancient Egypt, there's just a bunch of sun symbolism all over the place. We have the sun symbol on Sanji's outfit that he wears in the beginning of the arc. The Alabastian flag literally has a picture of the sun. Before Pell quote unquote dies, we have a little flashback where the sunset is kind of made to look like Luffy's straw hat. And even before that, in a Drum Island flashback, we see King Cobra wearing the sun symbol as well, except that symbol looks more like the sun that we see in the Kazuki clan emblem, as well as in relation to the buccaneer belief system. And so given that we recently learned that Nika and Joy Boy were different people, it's interesting to see the connection that the Alabastians had with the sun as a potential deity, given that we know that the palace in Alubarna was built 4,000 years ago. So we're talking way before Joy Boy's time. Now, if we go back to the Tomb of Kings, we see the sun symbol there in the middle being guarded by the figures of the Jackal and the Falcon, obviously being represented in real time by Chaka and Pell. And then at one point during the fight against Crocodile, Oda has Luffy declare that he's going to be king of the pirates, and he's literally standing in front of where the sun symbol is. In addition, there also appears to be a hieroglyph in the hallway, which is next to a sea cat statue that looks like it could be depicting the origin of double fruits. It just looks like it's a fruit being poofed into existence out of someone's request to a god. But beyond that, there are two main things that get highlighted within the arc that I'm pretty sure are going to play a key role. And one of them is the importance of Vivi's voice. So in the arc, Vivi is essentially trying to stop a civil war, except she's frustrated through most of it because she feels like her voice is not able to reach her people. So at one point, Luffy saves her from falling and says to her, don't worry, I can hear your voice which thematically to me connects to the idea of the golden bell being rung in Skypea so that it could be heard. And it also connects to the voice of all things. In fact, it actually reminds me of what Luffy tells Momonosuke in Zo, where he suggests that Momo should try talking to Sunisha because he has a feeling that Momonosuke's voice can reach the elephant. Now, by the end of the Alabasta arc, Luffy defeats Crocodile. He makes the sunshine reach all the way down to the tomb, it starts raining again, and Vivi yells out to the people to stop fighting. And so after that, we get a panel of Nami saying, wow, it looks like Vivi's voice was actually able to reach them. And so the reality of Vivi working together with Luffy to bring about peace to a kingdom is interesting, given that we know that world peace is something that is always on Oda's mind. Plus, in another SBS, we learned that Vivi's animal resemblance is that of a dove, which obviously we know is a worldwide recognized symbol of peace. So considering all of the previous, if we also consider the fact that Zoro begins delving into understanding the breath of all things in the Alabasta arc, to me it's very clear 
that just like Momonosuke, Oda intended and intends for Vivi to have the power of the voice of all things. With that in mind, I highly recommend watching this video of mine right here, where I discuss there being four ancient weapons, because I strongly suspect that Vivi having the voice of all things is going to end up being connected to the proper use of that fourth ancient weapon. In other words, I think Vivi is the missing piece as a royal family member for the fourth ancient weapon to work the way it's supposed to. And I think that's part of the reason for why Emu is desperate to get Vivi. So definitely check the video out if you haven't. Sometimes I feel like the YouTube algorithm is actively trying to kill my channel, which is pretty sad, but that's kind of how YouTube works now. Anyway, the last thing that I believe is a key takeaway from the Alabasta arc is something that King Cobra says not once, but twice, which is that as King, he believes that the people are the kingdom. And so the fact that Oda made Cobra repeat this phrase twice, to me, it makes it obvious that it is a fundamental principle in understanding the nature of the ancient kingdom, as well as the people with the D initial. Okay, so the people are the kingdom. What does that mean? So there are a couple of interpretations that we can make here. One that's, you know, pretty surface level is that the well-being of the kingdom depends on the well-being of the people. If the people are not doing well, then the country isn't doing well. Another thing that we can infer, and especially when it comes to the context of characters in the One Piece world, is that relationships build structures. It also means that if enough like-minded people come together, if they want to, they can create a country. And this concept gets exemplified perfectly during the Reverie flashbacks where we see that Cobra dies and is killed by Emu because in those chapters, Zabo gets a flashback and he thinks back at a time where he was young and he asks Ace and Luffy, hey, I noticed that both of you have the D initial in your name. And then Luffy says, yeah, I don't really care about that. If you want the D initial, Zabo, you can have it. It's yours. You could be Sa Debo or something like that. In addition, the idea of the people are the kingdom also means that as long as one person that belongs to that kingdom or carries the ideals of that kingdom is alive, then the kingdom cannot die. So as long as one person carries within them the ideals of the kingdom, then the kingdom is alive. Now, in terms of what this means for the future of the story, we have to remember that we are following Luffy's story. And so Luffy has to offer us as readers the answer to a history of conflict, a history of issues that have not been resolved yet in the story. Kind of like what happened in Naruto, where Pain would ask Naruto, what is your answer? Jiraiya couldn't figure it out. What is your answer to the circle of hate? I think what happened in the past, and I'm pretty sure that this is the case, I think that Sun God Nika created the Lunarians because Sun God Nika wanted a kingdom. That went away, that failed. Obviously, the Lunarians were exterminated, except for King. I think that Joy Boy, being the first pirate, created the Buccaneers. We know that the Buccaneers have giant's blood in them. Everything points to the idea of Joy Boy being a giant. And to me, like the idea of Buccaneers existing before Joy Boy, before the very first pirate, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I believe that the Buccaneers were created by Joy Boy because Joy Boy, just like Nika, wanted to create his own kingdom. Now, both Nika's and Joy Boy's efforts to bring about a, a brand new kingdom were left incomplete, but Luffy's won't be left incomplete. So at the end of the story, there's going to be a kingdom where it doesn't matter if you have wings or are a fishman or have giant's blood in you. It'll just be a kingdom of a bunch of different people, different races, different backgrounds. But at the end of the day, the kingdom will be all one piece. Thank you guys for watching. Take care. Have a great week. Catch you later.